that we must identify, do, take a final look at the situation, and then determine what is working well, what is not working well. So this is a preliminary analysis. So the next step of that, of course, is that you uh, identify why did this relationship not go well on your work breakdown structure. So this here is a work breakdown structure and for that particular project, and you identify where the issues were, and because of that bad relationship or that poor performance, what was the impact on the work breakdown structure? So if there was a, a misjudgment made or there was a delay because of which your, uh, your activity instead of taking five days took six days, what was the extra cost because of that additional day that had to be added because somebody did not respond in a timely fashion? So that you can capture easily at the work breakdown structure level and determine uh, what is the impact. So here, for instance, uh, you know, if we were to look into closer, you closer detail, you'll see that HR to design was a zero minus one relationship because HR uh, did not provide experienced uh, people to the design group that ended up causing a lot of problems in, in the design stage, had to go through a lot of rework and, and cause a bit of a problem. And so it's a very easy way to capture uh, you know, what that relationship is and how it is functioning. So let me, uh, with that quick introduction, let me take you through an example that uh, these are real projects that I'll be talking about uh, that were uh, that was studied by my student who was working in this, this research. So this is uh, uh, in Kuwait, and uh, it's a private company, construction company in Kuwait, and, and they had uh, six different projects in different areas and they were supposed to be uh, building parks. And these parks had different requirements, of course the green space, but they also had structures that needed to be put in a park, uh, and uh, you know, concession, concession stands and so on and so forth. And so that, that was the nature of the project. Um, so the estimated cost for one of those projects, for instance, was uh, $10 million, and there was 8% overhead built into that, and the bid price for the project was uh, $12 million. So this was the cost, uh, and then overhead, and that, that was the total cost. And uh, the duration was 24 months. So that was the situation on this particular project. So uh, this is what I just mentioned, so estimated profits. Then in addition to that, uh, if you were to do the math here, were uh, $1.5 million. So that was, the, that was what the situation was going into the project. So they did this analysis. Uh, my student went over there, to interview the project managers, talked to them, and, and uh, took the necessary data. And these were the issues that they were having. So they did this analysis. They identified what the problems were, uh, why there was a uh, there was a negative relationship uh, identified, and they did that exercise for all different issues uh, that were found out. And also uh, took it to the next level where they identified that, okay, if there was this relationship, what was the cost incurred, additional cost incurred because of that mismanagement or that lack of performance? So $15,000 loss here. Uh, and what was that as a percentage of the total profit margin that was built into the project? So here you can see that from point to point, you can identify how much of profit loss is happening at each point in the work breakdown structure where the relationship or the expected uh, outcomes were not met. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, you can put that on the work breakdown structure where issues were happening, and then you have a better sense of uh, what is working effect effectively and what is not working uh, quite as effectively. So you can, you can uh, here's some, another example here, for instance, uh, there was unanticipated breakdowns in relation between equipment, so ease equipment, and then the profit center. Uh, they, had, they had not anticipated breakdowns. As I mentioned, when we put together an estimate, we make assumptions. We might assume that there will be some repair required, some maintenance required, but if it goes over and above that, then of course that is going to cause uh, some loss somewhere. You might, you might argue that over a period of time that perhaps evens out, yes, yeah, sure. But this is to keep an eye on you know, what things are happening and where you need to take effective remedial actions uh, to improve the profitability of the company. 
So you can notice that when you do that exercise for all different elements where things were going not going well, you can you can see what was the total uh, incurred cost because of that relationship or additional cost, and what was the total impact on your property. So here, just for this one project, they are losing about four percent because of uh, the mismanaged interactions between the different entities on that particular project. Now, imagine putting this into the whole picture of your company, where you might have more than one project. So you have four, five, six projects going on, and if all of these projects are going to bleed money like this, then of course that is going to impact the bottom line of your project, uh, of your company, I mean. Uh, so the next, next step, of course, is that, okay, if these are the total uh, losses that you're facing, then what type of action do you need to take and what is the impact uh, of those actions uh, in, in correcting that situation? So, once we have identified where the problem was, the next step, as I mentioned, is to figure out you know, what, what could be done. So, I had taken this example before where there were inexperienced uh, engineers that were provided by the human resources department, and that caused a problem from the design side and uh, they had to do a lot of rework and so on. So, you know, what could be done? So, these are just some sample solutions, but uh, every problem that you face in your company, you will have a unique solution that works for you. So, you, it will be your responsibility to then identify, okay, how do I plug this issue? How do I, what remedial action is required? Uh, it, whether it could be training, whether it could be, you know, firing the bad engineers and hiring some good ones, so whatever that issue is. Oftentimes you'll find that, at least in the statistics that I have seen, that companies in, in the U.S. have 20% success rate, or even less than that. So every five projects that you tender, put a tender on, you bid for, you win one. How long do you think you can afford that? Every project, when you put together an estimate, costs money. So you need to look at ways of improving that uh, success rate. If you were to improve that from 20 to 25 percent or 30 percent, that's going to bring additional revenue to your to your company, and then you can do you know many more other things. So um, this type of analysis also helps you in that uh, direction as well. One of the solutions there could be that you bring in some experienced people who will know how to put a bid together properly and make you uh, more successful. So here was another example where they had uh, faced unanticipated breakdowns uh, and they did not have a repair and maintenance strategy in that company. So the recommendation there was that they need to be, uh, need to have a, a maintenance, repair, rehabilitation type of an activity going on so that their equipment is well maintained. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, you can always use this protocol for identifying changes in profit margin. And not only for that one project, but for your entire uh, company portfolio. Uh, this would, of course, lead you to improve the overall profitability of your organization. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the word profitability is the ability to generate profit. And as I explained just now, if your the units within your organization are not working effectively, then that is influencing the profitability of your company. Uh, of course, it, it also helps you in putting together better cost estimates because you now know uh, the assumptions that you had made were not successful. So next time going around, you can tweak those based on your understanding of what the problems were. So it helps you prepare uh, better cost estimates. And uh, uh, based on the nature or the relations that you have with the external entities, remember in, uh, one of the figures I showed that they're internal entities and then you're interacting with external entities as well. So if you realize that working with some particular owners has not been very profitable for you, then you'll be more cautious in how you put together a bid uh, for their projects, or you might totally decide, I don't want to work with them. Whatever that decision is, it helps you, these kind of analysis help you uh, make those uh, decisions in a better way. So, uh, of course, we are continuing that work. And uh, uh, you'll see that what I presented so far uh, did not consider uh, time. And uh, 
uh, the impact of time on cash flow and so on. So we said, well, we should we should address that aspect as well. So now, uh, so this work that I presented so far has gone through uh, one PhD student, one master student. So now another PhD student is taking on uh, research to continue this further in identifying, okay, if we were to include time as a factor, how can we work with that and figure out uh, what are the issues with respect to profitability? So what we're doing now is that we're using a, a system of systems approach. As you know, in, in a construction industry, or is a very good example of system of systems where multiple uh, entities interact with each other and they function as a singular system. So a system within a system to make an effective uh, uh, organization. Here's an example. For instance, uh, what you see there is that uh, these are group of owners, so O for owners, uh, G for general contractors, and S for subcontractors. So uh, different general contractors would be working with a set of owners, as we, as we all know. And uh, they might also be working with the same set of subcontractors. Now the question is that I'm, if I'm one of those general contractors, and I'm working with some of the subcontractors here, and I'm interacting with some of the owners on my different projects, um, it is not only my interaction that I need to be worried about. I need to also be thinking about how it is working out for some of my other competitors, or how are the owners dealing with some of the other competitors? Is that likely to influence me and my jobs that I take for that particular one as a general contractor? So that really, you can imagine that that complicates the issue further. That I not only need to be concerned about my own interactions within my company, but I need to be thinking about my other competitors as well. So. Uh, I'm not sure if you know about uh, bidding strategies, but one of the aspects of bidding strategies is to keep an eye on how your competitors are doing. So you can bid better than they are. So you can win more projects than they have been able to win, right? So that's how you really improve from that 20% to maybe 25 or 30% that I mentioned. So uh, that's what we were interested in looking at here. So what we're doing is uh, we are isolating uh, you know, a general contractor, let's say this one is handling three projects, three different owners, a different set of GCs, a different set of subs. Uh, some might be, you know, doing, working on multiple of these projects. So what is the interaction? Remember that I mentioned that if our cash flow is not effective, it is going to influence a bottom line. So cash flow becomes a critical aspect. So if we can control, if we can identify where the issues are likely to be, we can perhaps take some mitigation actions and, and improve our profit view. So this is just a profit chain. Uh, you know, once you realize uh, what the profit is going to be, you function, go through the process. So I'll not spend time there. But what happens is that, uh, you know, you can simulate the conditions on, on your project. So here you have millions of dollars in, 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 your, uh, in, in your profits or your earnings, sorry, and here you have time in weeks. In every project you see that after you uh, submit your invoice, you get paid and, and then you, know, you build up your earnings. The question is, are those earnings matching to the profit that you had uh, planned for initially in the project? So you can easily map against how your, uh, uh, how your uh, earnings are coming up and, and how does it match to uh, the profits that you had projected for that particular project. If you were to do this, so of course it's all done based on uh, system dynamics uh, modeling, but if you were to do that for your different interactions on different projects that you have, then you can see that you know, it creates a different set of patterns. And if you were to look at it now for the entire portfolio, then you see how different projects are likely to unfold is there a delay in, in, uh, in getting the profit out of a particular, comp a particular project? What type of delays are uh, uh, possible? What type of issues are likely to happen? And you get a complete picture of how that profit is likely to be realized on all the entire portfolio of your projects. As I mentioned before, you can, you can plot it for your entire firm. So this is... Uh, uh, unearned revenue, this is your 
earn uh, revenue for current year, and, and so on. You can plot all of these and get a sense for uh, how your company is performing with respect to what you had planned and how it is unfolding now in the future. So by putting that time element into the whole analysis. Well, this research, of course, continues, and we are going to be looking at, so every time we think about this research, there are a lot of other issues that open up. So, of course, uh, one research leads to another, leads to another. So, you can see that uh, there are other issues that we want to discuss as well. Uh, as I mentioned, it is not only one general contractor, but there are multiple general contractors. So, is it going to influence me? if I am a general contractor, if my fellow partners are not doing well? Or how does it influence me if some, somebody else is winning all the jobs because they're lowballing the bids? So can I survive that environment where uh, another general contractor is putting in as cheap a bid as possible? So what do I do in that case? Right? So those kind of issues we want to tackle as well, taking this model a little bit further. So that's what I had to present. Uh, that's a building, by the way, that's civil engineering. Uh, I should have brought a photograph where Professor Sani was standing right about there, and uh, I forgot to do that. <laughs> so that's what I have. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Good morning, sir. I'm Philippe Trocchi from PQS, MBA. Sir, my question is, when you talk about profitability analysis, the risk management, and the bidding, can't you bring the profitability analysis, which is an ongoing process, and the risk management, which is a predetermined process, can't we bring the profitability analysis at the very early stages, and then control the bidding? Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's interesting. See, the probability analysis is a continuous process. It is not that you do it uh, only when you're starting every month, perhaps, or whatever the time frame is that you want to do. And the reason I say that is because you have multiple projects going on, and they all have a different time structure. Some might be in the initial stages, some might be in later stages. So there are different set of issues. If you were to throw in risk for each project into that equation, you'll see that every project will have certain different risk profile. So that creates a situation where you really need to keep an eye that how are things unfolding uh, between the interactions between cost center and profit center. So if you were to uh, take that analysis, let's say every month, for instance, then you can identify which departments are having problems. If you were to focus on that one particular department, you can identify which individual or individuals who were dealing with that particular project, why did things go wrong the way they did? So you can dig deeper and deeper if you can identify where the issues are spawning. So I, I personally recommend that this analysis be done as frequently as possible. Of course, merging with risk management. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, two general questions. Not specifically related to uh, your topic, but uh, generally in uh, construction industry. Uh, one of the questions I would like to ask is that uh, uh, the use of technology in construction industry, uh, how e effective is this in the process of the construction industry uh, in their activities? Uh, like we are using the, uh, Google Glass, uh, uh, we are using drones and some other technologies that are coming up. Uh, and uh, my next question, uh, the uh, question is that, uh, I hope it may be look, uh, some funny, but uh, it has been there for uh, quite some time with me, that, you know, in the construction industry, uh, there is a gender gap there. I mean, gender inequality. We don't see women working in the uh, construction industry. So why is that happening? Is it because that they don't have the capacity, or uh, is there any? Uh, there is no uh, favorable uh, job conditions for them, or it is happening only in Asia, but it is not happening in uh, Western world. 
Thank you. Very, very good question. Very good question. Um, if I understood your first question, you're talking about why advanced technology is not being used in construction, or I, I'm saying like how e e efficient they are to, to use that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, part of what we have been doing, and part of my portfolio, also includes a website called Emerging Construction Technologies. So if you get a chance, Google Emerging Construction Technologies, and you will come across that website. We started that effort, um, well, it actually started almost 15, 16 years ago uh, with Professor Halpin, as uh, Dr. Sani mentioned. And then when I took over, I, I kept that process going. And what we do in that website is that we identify what are the emerging technologies in construction. And Google Glass or other, other issues, of course, show up. And um, we have about 200 different technologies, and we keep on changing those technologies as new things come up. The main idea there was that if we bring it to the people and they know that there exists such a new technology, they might want to use it. So of course, you know, we get uh, 12,000 plus hits every month on that website. So it's, it's, a very, it's, it's well, very well received across the world. Um, what happens in terms of uh, diffusion of technology